Hey, it's Liz Kelly, and welcome to the Ringer Podcast Network. Starting this week, we're launching a new show on the Ringer Dish feed, recapping the return of Survivor for its special 40th season. This season features 20 previous winners of Survivor competing for $2 million, the largest cash prize in reality TV show history. Riley McAtee and a rotating guest from the Ringer staff will recap every Thursday. So make sure you subscribe to the Ringer Dish feed for shows like Jam Session, Tea Time, and the new Survivor Recap Show on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. I need support staff to clear the room. Stand up and walk. Now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me in the studio, fresh out of cave stock, it's Andy Greenwald! You know, we are on camera today for the first time in a while. For, for, a for the Better Call Saul portion of this podcast, funny, we will be. Funny thing to spring on a guy. <laughs> at 8 in the morning. Who's recently, you know, who's grown used to glam squad. FYI, we're but on cam today. I want people to know that when they check out the portion that will be on camera. Uh-huh. Just know that moments before we began talking about Better Call Saul, the, the relevant portion of our podcast today, yeah. we were wearing fox and bear masks. <laughs> and I won't say who was who's wearing which ones. Who's the fox and who's the bear? <laughs> it's Monday. We don't know yet. We'll know by Thursday. You know, I love to see some prehistoric saber tooth tracks. <laughs> we have a lot of outsider to discuss this later on. I've got, I got some notes. You do? I've got some questions. Okay. Um, I actually, I really enjoyed that episode, Foxhead. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to talk about Better Call Saul, the season premiere for season five uh, last night. Mm-hmm. See, episode two is coming out today. Nice little... Tonight. Yeah. Uh, interesting move by, by AMC to put the two episodes up in successive nights, and then episode three will be next week. I would say, uh, and I say this purely context-free yes. in a vacuum, Yeah. just as a person who, as you said at the beginning of the podcast, is back into the culture pool. Yes. I would say that any chance you get to build momentum for a basic cable network uh-huh. drama show is yeah. a good move and you should yeah. take it okay <laughs> just just like just views from the couch right that's your that's your like monday morning quarterback view of it i'm a man of the people <laughs> the people that attend cave stock uh by the way andy mm-hmm. also besides better call Saul episode two tonight mm-hmm. there's also briar patch episode three is airing tonight it is at 11 p.m eastern after wrestling on usa network right this is our new time slot for the rest of the season going forward a prey wrestling Make a date of it. Uh, put on your lycra <laughs> suit. <laughs> Just like dudes in their luchador masks. Something, something, Max. something top rope. Yeah. I right. don't even have. Off the top rope. You remember Jimmy Superfly Snuka? No. Here's the thing. And I say this with love, affection, and honestly, deep gratitude. To Monday Night Raw? Yeah. To <laughs> the McMahon family. <laughs> all of the people who I now owe my professional career to. <laughs> and my continued creativity, uh, at least in terms of the uh, television landscape. I don't know anything about wrestling, and I never have. And this isn't one of those, like, ha-ha, like I'm trying to downplay like a, a something in my life that yeah. I used to know about or something I was ashamed of. I watched the Hulk Hogan and Friends cartoon, and I like Junkyard Dog, and then I watch Glow. Yes. There is nothing in between. Right. Them. The right. Mickey Rourke film, The Wrestler, I saw. Well, and speaking of wrestling also, this week's rewatchables is uh, me, Ryan Rossillo, and Bill Simmons talking about Vision Quest. Right, which which I'm excited about. Which is because a, a wrestling film. When we talked, we told me that you had just done that, I mixed it up with Gleaming the Cube, which is about skateboarding, <laughs> another thing that was popular in the 80s that I know nothing about. Yeah. Well, there was a skateboarding um, brand called Vision. <laughs> thank you, like, as if I would know that. Do you <laughs> remember, what was the surf company that had the big gorilla and they made a Nintendo video game about it? Remember there was a surfing brand? Oh, wait. And there was like a whole cast of characters and they were kind of a thing for a moment on t-shirts. Like Gorilla Surfers? No, no. Like they, they were like cartoon characters and they were a surf company. Someone's going to hit us with this. I don't know. I'm sure these guys are probably psyched mind. that they're filming this. <laughs> this is gold. This, um, anyway, only thing to say is episode 103 airs tonight. It is a big one. It's one I'm really proud of, really excited about. The cast joining the show in this episode is outrageous. Alan Cumming shows up. Still, not, still cannot believe he is on He's awesome. my TV show. Uh, the great Ed Asner is on the show. Yeah. David Paymer, recently of Star Trek Picard. Oh, did he make an uh, appearance? A lovely guy. The two of them play father and son. And it's worth noting that 80% of their dialogue, if not more, when they are on screen together uh, in episode three is ad lib. Is it were, really? They were fantastic together. <laughs> and it, really proud of that. The brilliant Christine Woods, who a surprisingly robust number of people love and adore like I do from her time on Hello Ladies, mm. the HBO show. Yeah, of course. Joins the cast. Mel Rodriguez, uh, who is on Better Call Saul. Yeah. Along with a lot of other great shows. Um, was the, 
why am I blanking on the Will Forte show? Last Man. Last Man on Earth. Last Man on Earth, yeah. yeah. And uh, people get that confused with Last Man Standing. Right. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Which, which is definitely, that, that's more where I am politically, right? Uh, Last yes. Man Standing. Uh, <laughs> anyway, all of this is to say, you can watch 103 On Demand now if you want, but we're at 11 p.m. going forward, and someone was asking me about Briar Patch on Twitter, mm-hmm. and they were like, will this episode be on YouTube too? And I'm like, my guy, at a certain point. We're all on YouTube, man. You, well, this footage is going on YouTube, but at a certain point, you're 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 gonna have to watch the show, uh, like the way <laughs> the monetizing elements want you to watch the show. That's good. I'm sorry, Sean Fanning. I know content wants to be free. You're on the other side now. Dog. I'm just saying you don't have to, but it would be great. Yeah. So if even if you've already seen it and you don't stay up to 11 p.m., which is just me, put like a crash test dummy on a couch. No, you turn not, it on if you've already seen it. But you don't need to put a dummy. It's not like the HOV lane. No one is checking <laughs> your house. Nielsen Company is not like Let running drones. Let me do drones. my bit, okay? <laughs> okay, do your bit. I want everybody to watch the show tonight. Yeah, just turn on your TV and go that's, to bed. That's like what a I'm normal. saying. Yeah. And you don't have to put a crowd. In. The Nielsen family is not looking in your home. Well, looking. I mean, they're doing biometric scans for heat signatures <laughs> like a predator. Right. <laughs> That's right. But anyway, yeah. So uh, Only a last bit of house cleaning to do is that, um, or housekeeping, is I would just say that- House cleaning would be, you're fired, Andy. <laughs> if you haven't already, check out Music Exists, the podcast I'm doing with Chuck Klosterman that's on Spotify. Uh, the first three episodes went up last Wednesday. It was really great to hear from people that they that they liked it or, or that they had questions or concerns too. If they did, I didn't get those messages, but people who liked it, thank you very much. I've really enjoyed making that podcast. Uh, we actually have recorded it. So uh, the episodes will be coming out one a week. So the new one goes up this Wednesday. And I think people will dig it. It's a, it's a fun fun conversation. Quick follow-up. Mm-hmm. Will episode three be on YouTube? Or do I have to listen to it on Spotify? <laughs> you have to listen to it on Spotify. Wow. <laughs> um, let's also, the second half of today's episode, after Andy and I get done talking about Better Call Saul and The Outsider, second half of the episode is my interview with Greg Dooley, which is, Fantastic. you know, always a pleasure to talk to Greg Dooley. I think probably Afghan Wigs, Greg Dooley is Andy and I, one of Andy and I's shared favorite musicians. Did you name them when you did your High Fidelity podcast that I didn't listen I to? I didn't. I screwed up. Yeah. I just, I whiffed because they were like top five and I was just like, uh, and I just said the first five that came to my mind. Bell Biv DeVoe. Yeah. Um, John Martin. Mm-hmm. I really love like British folk. Let's start talking about Better Call Saul. Wait. Greg Dooley has a new album. Yeah, it's called Random Desire. It's weirdly his first solo album. Yeah, and it came out on Friday, so you can check that out wherever you check out music. It's fantastic. I only wish that I had been here for this conversation, not only because I love the fact that Greg Dooley is someone we can talk to because we've admired him and liked him for so long, but I just feel very... uh, I I feel like he was always a person, an outsized personality in our lives, in our fandom when we were younger, because he also... It's not only were his songs cinematic and epic and exciting, but he seemed to live a very uh, loose lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And I'm just so happy that now uh, he's the person I run into at acupuncture. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like that is, it's the way of all things when they, when they move to Los Angeles eventually. Let's get into Better Call Saul. Yes. First episode of the fifth and penultimate season. It was called uh, Magic Man. This is a thing now, announcing your penultimate season. Yeah. So, and, and there have been some speculation that Saul theoretically, mm-hmm. could go on for as long as they sort of wanted to do it. And it has, I think in some people's estimation, at least drawn even with Breaking Bad in some ways. As to, and Obviously, I don't think anything is an, as like an event show on TV the way Breaking Bad was anymore, with the exception of Game of Thrones, which no longer is with us. But uh, it has also followed the show's trajectory, or the Breaking Bad show the trajectory, in the sense that it had these modest beginnings, I think, where people are a little bit skeptical about, like, do we need a Saul show? It's weird. And had a, a, a lot of people were making jokes at its expense, us primarily about its obsession with paperwork and mm-hmm. the amount of retirement home tax evasion that was going on. Mm-hmm. Our RIP Sandpiper. Mesa Verde, man. Yeah. Um, and then it got a huge boost over the years from Netflix, which we've discussed. M- about much how, like Breaking Bad did. Yeah, as, as much like Breaking Bad did. And I think its fourth season was among the best seasons of TV that I may have seen in the decade. Like, mm-hmm. it was just an astonishing, uh, astonishing piece of storytelling. I'm so excited for it to be back. We're going to be talking about it pretty much week to week. Um, so let's get into the to the first episode. Um, first reactions to it. Uh, obviously, the longest flash forward we've had so far. Yeah. With uh, Gene in Nebraska. And, um, you know, I'm really just, I'm worried about the long-term viability of that Cinnabon. 
Yeah, do you think you think you think that that Cinnabon can't survive the loss of Takovic? Yeah, well, you know, I think each Cinnabon really bears the fingerprints of its of its manager. You know, I think recent moves in the NBA have, have made me question whether coach how important coaching and management is. That's right. You know, if That's you have right. a, if you have players on you the think field, Gene is the Elton Brand of that Cinnabon. If you have players on the field like Gene clearly does, yeah, who players who just from a phone call are there to open the franchise. Players who are there to check if anyone is sketching out, you know, looking for the A wall manager, mm-hmm. it can run itself. It can call its own place. I'm sorry, Gene, yeah. but the extraction is okay to go. So we had a very long flash forward, probably took up the first act of the show. I would say the first act of the episode where Gene gets made essentially by the um, the cab driver from season four, and he calls uh, the late Robert Forster in what I imagine must be his last screen appearance, and initially starts the process of extraction, of mm-hmm. getting disappeared again, mm-hmm. and then changes his mind and decides that he is going to go on the offensive, at least we think. And uh, the rest of the episode is pretty standard Better Call Saul episode of, I mean, in so much as it's a lot of stuff in the Albuquerque courthouse and at, at uh, Jimmy and Kim's apartment. Mm-hmm. And then we have the Lalo, Nacho, uh, Gus, Salamanca mm-hmm. um cartel stuff going on in the the street dealing. Uh, I just thought it was excellent. I'm so glad it's back. I have a couple of notes, but I wanted to hear what you th- thought of the episode uh, on whole. Well, a couple things. This, like all great shows, has now taught us how to watch it. Mm-hmm. And it's also earned its pace and its own language and tone and style. And the result of that is when you watch a season premiere like this, you're not just watching what you're seeing on TV at that moment. You're watching it on top of the monument built by the previous four seasons. Yeah. And so every moment is excruciating in the most delicious way imaginable. And it's a it's a different feeling than Breaking Bad had. Breaking Bad, especially as it ramped up to the end, was an almost exhilarating free fall yeah. to the bottom. This is so tinged with sadness and melancholy and regret that it is in some ways... I don't want to, I'm not someone who says that this is a superior show to Breaking Bad, but it is a more mature show in all ways, both because the people making it are such God level experts of their craft at this point, and you can tell, Mm -hmm. but also the emotions that it's trafficking in are less catastrophic, less absolute, less shoot 'em up motion picture, and much more just the kind of slow drip tragedy of life. It's a real like middle class, middle aged show. It is. And I love that it has embraced that and owned it. And I also love that the, 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 the very unique and specific nature of the show held aloft by the goodwill of the DNA of one of the most popular and beloved shows of the last 20 years. Also, you know, the way Netflix has been there for it to keep it going mm-hmm. uh, allows it to just stay true to itself and stay true to that kind of bittersweet tone. Yeah. And so... Obviously, that that opening, you know, we could just talk about the opening because it's everything that's good about the show contained within it, from just the expert cinematography to the way tension is built and then to the way we get a payoff coming sideways when you least expect Mm -hmm. it in a banal way, you know, more than anything else. Everything is time spent. So the fact that they've done these flash forwards throughout the show which started off as like almost a curiosity and like a mystery box and have now built to the point where when is it J- who's the cab what's the cab driver's name I forget Jeff Jeff the cab driver comes up to Gene Jimmy Saul in the mall mm-hmm. who's eating his sandwich and reading I think a biography of David Niven I really wanted to see what it was I couldn't see Yeah uh and he comes up to him and he's he's like I drove Sammy Hagar and you're like is this where, where's this going and then when he, and he blows up his spot, you're just like, ah, it's so much different than if they had condensed that into, you know, they just did this, this, this time. You, well, would, you wouldn't feel that, that sense of like weird crushing release because now at least you know what's going to happen. He's going to have to either go on the offensive or run. There, there's a, but there's still, there's a confidence to this that is just not recreatable, you know? You you couldn't get away with any of this if you were different people mm-hmm. than Vince Gilligan and Peter Gould and their brilliant crew. But you also couldn't do it without the long shadow of Breaking Bad. I mean, the forward-moving story of this show 
has been doled out to us in five increments now, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. At the opening of each season. That's so crazy. It's so luxurious. Yeah. And so rare that it's really a pleasure to indulge in. And I think the other thing that I want to say about the show, especially at, at the start of what I'm sure will be a, a satisfying season. I mean, again, how often can you say that? Sure. That, that level of confidence. It, it is worth saying again why we were not wrong, because I don't think we ever said the show wasn't good, but we weren't as vigilant about keeping up with it, about appreciating it yeah. as, as we could have been. And it's interesting. I, I was thinking about when I was watching it last night and thinking about our kind of gap in appreciating the show to conversations that I had and also conversations that I've listened to from, as you know, the person I, I identify as my favorite Ringer podcaster, celebrity super chef Dave Chang. Sure. And a lot of the things that he tries to talk about in terms of with restaurants, things that are actually good, things that actually have lasting value versus the hot new story or, you know, the, the, the vagaries of critical taste or Instagram or whatever. And a couple of weeks ago, he had a, a, a typically great episode with a chef named Marco Canora, who's at a, a restaurant in the East Village called Hearth for over 10 years, which is a really long time in restaurant years. Yeah. And I love listening to it because the truth is, when I was in New York and when I would go back to it, Hearth is like, that's the restaurant I want to go to because I like it there because they treat you well. It's a lovely room to sit in. All the food is good. And you feel very happy when you emerge from it and you're on East 10th Street. And it's like, I equate that with being in New York and I equate good sure. feelings and everything about it is quality. And no one writes about Hearth anymore. It doesn't get reviewed. No one interviews Marco about his restaurant. Right. Because it's just good. Right. And that's kind of the Better Call Saul conundrum at this point. Uh, it is not flashy. It is not surprising. And weirdly... I don't know what it has to say about the current state of television or how we watch it or what to look for in terms of trends or attitudes. It has slipped the bounds of normal context and conversation in the zeitgeist in a way that could doom some things, but actually I think has lifted it up. Well, so Breaking Bad was a participant in something that I think kind of broke our brains when it came to TV, which is Endgame. It's just everything mm -hmm. is when a show becomes a significant part of the culture in any kind of way, even like something like Mad Men, which proportionally was like a very poorly rated CBS show, had an outsized piece yeah. of the pie in terms of conversation online and, and on podcasts and on sites. And we essentially built this podcast at, on, on talking about those kinds of shows. But all of those shows wound up becoming about where is this going and how is it going to end mm -hmm. and how is it going to wrap up and what does that mean and what does it mean for everything. And you basically, you know, saw over the course from the trajectory from Lost through Mad Men and The Wire and Breaking Bad and um, especially Game of Thrones and, and then even shows like Leftovers and Watchmen and Westworld, this like kind of like obsession with unlocking a show and, mm -hmm. un, and figuring a show out mm -hmm. and then evaluating it almost entirely on where it landed rather than what it was like to be in the air before that. And that's not going to be a problem with Better Call Saul. I mean, we want to know what happens to Kim. We mm -hmm. want to know what happens to Nacho. But I don't think it's going to be very good, you know? And I'm okay with that. And everything else is already there for us. Yeah, but also, I think the show has done a really brilliant job of adding wrinkles that I didn't know we would care for or sure. need. And, and specifically... One of the things that I said often, and I think it's slightly different than the point you're making, which I agree with about, about Endgame, was one of my, I, I, I say, when, every time I say concern, I just feel like it's concern trolling. But it, no, was, it was something legitimate that maybe kept the show at arm's length for me for a while, was the way prequels rob stories of stakes, mm -hmm. because we know who lives and who dies. But knowing that, and still being grateful for more time with Jonathan Banks performing sure. the role of Mike, I don't think I was ready for the the Werner storyline that was the bulk of last year into this first episode. Well, that, and that's affecting, emotionally affecting a character who is essentially a brick wall and is unchanging across both series. And that's exactly what I was thinking about. The Werner storyline is a, is a perfect example of like in J school and you're, you, you know, when you learn really basics of telling a story, uh, uh, reporting a story out, it's who, what, when, where, why, and how. All Better Call Saul really cares about is how. Mm -hmm. And through how, tells you everything you could ever possibly want to know about these people. Mm -hmm. And that's the gift that I think the Gilligan Gould Axis has is understanding the mechanics of how things happen and mm -hmm. finding that in these like elaborate like 
you know, Jimmy's mail fraud scheme that, you know, he enacts in season four, I think, on the bus, taking the bus to Louisiana or whatever he does. Like, doing something like that tells you so much about every character that's involved in that process rather than the characters just telling you that or rather than, you know, anything else. And we don't need to know where or or what with this with the show we kind of have an idea about what it, that is you know there's going to be so much significant stuff that happens to the Jimmy Saul Gene character that we've really already seen i mean i i doubt that they will ever do if i had to guess they won't do breaking bad timeline stuff mm-hmm. in better call Saul it'll mm-hmm. just go from the beginning of breaking bad and then jump to after breaking bad mm-hmm. but I really don't care about any of that stuff. Everything about this show is about watching the ways in which, especially with the Jimmy and Kim relationship, people change over time and how that affects the other people in their life. lives. I agree. I mean, not since Sam Hinkie is any group of people cared about process as much yeah. as these guys yeah. do. And it's admirable. It's incredible. Uh, we reap the benefits of it. And cumulatively, which is you know really the way this show shines, it's incredibly rewarding. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, now we have been trained to watch it. We know that the first episode is going to be a very gentle clearing of the throat, a reshuffling of the deck, and then some signs about where we're headed. Yeah. That said, for a show that has been very gradual and very gentle, again, almost to a fault, because when we were living in Chuck World, I think you and I chafed against it sometimes. Yeah. And now it all feels earned. It cha- it's, I, think, I think the stakes changed when the cartels came in. But that said, uh, Jimmy suddenly wearing garish suits like, like they were always hanging in his closet yeah. felt very sudden yeah. for this show. Yeah. I think that Rhea Seahorn, one of the great actresses whose name we can't agree on how to say, but we're just going to keep blundering through, has always played it brilliantly. I think her face was everybody's face. Like, who is this? Yeah. Carnival Barker. Uh, Literally. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, I know that's, I was realizing that's Mike Bloomberg's favorite insult. Is it? So I'm feeling pretty current. <laughs> um, but uh, that felt sudden. And it felt like potentially a bridge too far. But again, for 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 the plausibility of this relationship. But again, because they are so granular in their attention to story and to detail, the end of the episode was addressing that. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they their notes process for themselves must be so fascinating. Oh, yeah. Um, because, you know, again, all I can do is say anecdotally from my own experience in a writer's room, anytime there was a potential storytelling problem, I and the other writers, I mean, we were well aware of it. You can circle it. You can devote a day to talk about it. Whether you were ever able to address it in a way that is satisfying both to you or to your writers or to your network or to your audience is TBD. Sure. These guys just seem like they just circle the wagons and get it done. Uh-huh. And so and having, have fun doing it. Yeah. And having her be appalled by what she sees and offended by what he does. And then when left alone, acknowledging the utility of it mm-hmm. and, then, and then having an extra moment truly alone to process it. I mean, that's just, it, it's they know what emotional notes to play and when to play them. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't say it better. Uh, so that's Better Call Saul, episode one. Oh, also, Tony Dalton is fucking Yo, incredible. So I, the only thing I would say, you talk about concern trolling, mm. is the Salamanca Gus Nacho stuff too good? Um, <laughs> like because you just want more of that raw? Well, that unstepped on I, Albuquerque I just flight? find that, I, I guess I would say this. Mm-hmm. I find that to be incredibly compelling <laughs> television. Well, <laughs> Whereas like Jimmy and Kim, like I, I love and I love watching the subtle changes, but they, at least for a while now, have been doing kind of the same dance steps. Well, I, but that's why I think the Lalo character is so phenomenal. And the actor, I just am totally in love with this actor. I just think he's magnetic every yeah. time he's on the screen. It's what, th- it honestly, it's what the other side of the ball needed. To me, him being there and being charismatic and terrifying and unpredictable and big in the way that a lot of great screen villains are sure. big helps so much because it it separates that piece of the show from both the we already know how a lot of this is going to end up piece of it mm-hmm. like Tyrus and the super lab we know all that seeing the brothers show up from across the border it, I mean the, the fan service stuff is fun 
But again, we know how a lot of that end, ends up. Having something electric on that side of it really helps balance the show yeah. in a way. Because, because there was a lot of the first few seasons was Mike was being methodical and then Jimmy and Kim were being methodical. And now we've got that raw uncut flowing through <laughs> half of the show yeah. in a way that I really, really enjoy. Yeah, and, 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 and as you said, it helps be that this character is untethered from the larger reality, except that, you know, and this is something I did not remember at all until we talked about it in the last season on the podcast, that the first time Saul appears, or the first time they get him in the desert in Breaking Bad, he talks about Lalo. Yeah. So something's coming. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be back to talk about Outsider. Today's episode of The Watch is brought to you by The Real Real. Own iconic luxury items at unreal value with The Real Real, the leading reseller of authenticated luxury consignment from top designers like Louis Vuitton, Gucci, Rolex, Cartier, and hundreds more at up to 90% off retail. Shop and consign women's and men's luxury fashion and streetwear as well as fine jewelry, watches, art, and home. New arrivals come in daily and every item undergoes The Real Real's meticulous authentication process. In fact, The Real Real employs over 100 plus brand specialists, gemologists, horologists, and art curators from around the globe who inspect thousands of items each day to ensure that every item is authenticated. Shop luxury the sustainable way. Go online, download the app, or visit one of the stores in Soho, West Hollywood, or their newest location at 870 Madison Avenue in New York. Consigners, try out the Real Reels white glove service for free in-home pickup today. Shop in store online or download the app and get 20% off select items with the promo code REAL. That's the realreal.com promo code REAL for 20% off select items. Okay, we're back. Let's talk a little bit about Outsider Episode 8. Foxhead. I thought that was the most Stephen King ass episode of this show so far. First of all, shout outs to JD Dillard, yeah. who directed this episode, uh-huh. who was trending on Twitter over the weekend. Was he? Because he has been rumored to be a director of a new Star Wars film. I didn't know that. Lovely guy. I believe a Philly guy. Is he? Yeah, he worked with our friend Gina, who edited Briar Patch, on a little scene movie called Sweetheart that That's shouldn't right. be little scene. And so this was exciting to see his work on this episode. It had some beautiful touches that, you know, were in the world of the show. Yeah. The show does a lot of, um, not split focus, but, uh, you know, like the-, the Deep sh- focus? Well, the shot of, for example, the mask. Yeah. In the evidence bag while the sister is being It's a uh, Damn, that's like what Orson Welles does. Yeah. Greg Tolan. It's like what Orson Welles does, guys. <laughs> we are- Don't set me up and then Highly me. paid cultural commentators. And uh, even, you know, I, I work in the visual medium. <laughs> Look, uh, I love watching the show. I enjoy it. It was a little scary for my guy, was it? It was uncomfortable. Yeah, my, my dude does not like to be frightened. I don't like that. <laughs> Would you like That's to... That shit you don't like. Well, there's two things to say. Bear masks and screaming prehistoric evil. Well, no. So this episode steered the show directly to, and maybe we should just begin by talking about this, two of the things that I don't love, it's <laughs> extremely cheap key voice, <laughs> extremely don't like about this genre. Um, this genre being Stephen King or just well, horror, horror in general? Horror okay. in general. One is... Don't like being scared. <laughs> but Yeah. But one is, you know, that the feeling where they're like, the camera will now land on innocent children. Mm-hmm. And then you check the time and there's like 37 minutes left. It's like, come on. I don't like that. I don't like sitting with it. Not a fan. So but you would two, rather just like the last second a little boy gets taken by the bear man? Well, no. I'm, I'm just saying there's two kinds of fear and disquiet. And like someone in an animal mask turning and looking like shining... I find deeply scary, but I can watch it. Sure. Like, I've seen the film The Shining. when you know something is building and they're, like, having their little chat in the Winnebago. Yeah, that's really hard for me. Okay. But two— Because it's kids, not because of any—not because, like, you just— Oh, yeah, if it was, like, adults, come on. You'd be like, chat it up. Whatever. Yeah, you guys talk— Keep talking, yokels. Y'all talking crystal caves? (laughs) The second thing is, and I'm curious your thoughts on this for the episode, is— Inevitably, and this is true of a lot of different genres, of course, but I think it's, I, I, for the sake of this conversation, we'll, we'll talk about it in terms of horror. An unspoken, unknown, mysterious evil haunting something mm. allows for such interesting character work and feelings of vague feelings of dread sure. and, and wonderful buildup. Once it becomes— Once you give it a name. Well, once you give it a silly name and Patty Considine is just chowing down on— tumors in the backseat of your camper van. Mm-hmm. 
okay. This is, so you this, have this just is, outlined. This is when it becomes, once you have to name it, I would you? say what you've just outlined is the thing that bothers most people. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say including myself, although I obviously I think have like a more of a tolerance for it than you do about Stephen King. Mm -hmm. The 75% mm -hmm. getting to the place, getting to the name, getting to the reveal, getting to the understanding of, oh, it's on a Native American burial ground. All the stuff leading up to that is awesome. The sense of place, the sense of unease, the sense of disquiet. The sense the of community. Cre and the, and the, the sense of community that builds up out of people sorting, deciding that they're going to combat this. And then finally coming together as they did in this And episode. the gathering of the, of the believers and non-believers at, at Claude's brother's house is classic king. It's yep. classic like, you know, we may have our differences, but ultimately at the end of the day, we all need to confront this thing. It's the stand. It's it. It's I. Don't have familiarity with other Stephen King works, but I <laughs> Maximum it's in Overdrive, the, if sure. you've ever seen the Emilio Estevez film. <laughs> Eyes of the Dragon, sure. Um, the problem that some people have is when it gets explained, is when he's like, it turns out that this is like, El Cuco sounds like a, a really pissed off bear mm -hmm. or a saber toothed tiger or whatever the fuck he's supposed to be. And he, uh, you know, is, is sarcastic about, about not getting cancer free flesh to eat and yeah. stuff like that. And I, I still think that the show works on so many different levels, almost despite the kingness of it, mm. because of the priceness of it. Mm -hmm. And that comes across. Also, you guys did it. You put Ben Mendelsohn and Cynthia Revo in a car and just let it go for 10 minutes. Yeah. Like, that's how you make television. Mm -hmm. It's not that hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, just put a camera in the backseat. Yeah. And have these two people tell each other stories for while they're driving. That's great. That's great. It's that is actually the reason why this show should be ten episodes. I Not agree. there is something that this person ordinarily would have figured out, but we're going to tease it along for two more episodes, which is what I felt like happened a little bit at the two third marker of this show. But this stuff, where it's like, that's what builds up people willing to sacrifice themselves for other people. It builds up a sense of a bond between the audience yeah. and the characters. Is hearing Ben Mendelsohn tell that what Washington Square story mm -hmm. and Cynthia Riva just being like, that sounds like a coincidence. It was great. It was such a great moment. I, I didn't appreciate, and I should have, because, again, the pedigree behind the camera and behind the scenes of the show is, is stellar. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand or appreciate mainly because you and I still aren't sure how many episodes are on this season of television, that this was an ensemble show. Mm -hmm. And so in the beginning, because again, I did not know the book. I was clearly spun around about it. The, the, uh, it was so clearly set up to be one of those like Bateman only lasts an episode shows. Sure. But I didn't get that. I didn't know it was going to expand beyond this case. I had no idea what the show was or what the property was. So that's on me. But at the same time, I did wonder why... Yul Vasquez and Jeremy Bob and Bill Camp um, and Patty Considine. And Derek Cecil. Yeah, were, all these people, yeah. Were there. Um, other than maybe a nice HBO paycheck or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't realize the show would give them all room like a Stephen King novel does, like great HBO show. I mean, it's all there. I'm, this is only on me for not realizing yeah. it. Yeah. But these are great actors who have been allowed to develop characters in the margins over time so that now when Jeremy Bob's Alex shows up. It does the I, copper in my mouth story. I yeah. mean, I remember that story on Simpsons, on the Simpsons when it was in McBain, but sure. <laughs> Jeremy I Bob's like, foot I don't anymore. go on foot patrol anymore because I just bought a boat called Live Forever. Yeah, right. But I guess I'll just set sail for Tennessee. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's great to see and enjoyable to see. And also, you know, to your point about how sometimes it's not that complicated. Yul Vasquez, great New York stage actor, uh, was recently in Russian Doll in a completely different part, almost unrecognizable. This was Jeremy Bob. Oh, that's right. Yeah. They're both in that in completely different, also a great stage actor, also in completely different, uh, a totally different type of role. Um, give him something to do and just let them cook in the background. They're great. Mm -hmm. They're just great. And that's the kind of world building that, that I can get behind. And, and, and again, it's not always going to be perfect. And so I think to your point, they were very serious and respectful about servicing what I imagined the book to be about and leading us to this place where we've named the evil and we've now seen the evil and we're going to confront the evil. Um, but they've also, with, I think, a lot of forethought, 
prepared us for that inevitable. And it's not going to be, it's not a disappointment. Sure. But it's a trend, it's a different type of show at that point. And they've prepared us for it by stacking the deck ahead of time with things that we do care and love about, so care about and love. The thing that makes the show great is the combination of King and Price aside from the performances. And I think the thing that is sometimes a little bit like a light flashing in your peripheral vision mm-hmm. is the combination of King and Price. Mm-hmm. Because Price is so good at two cops bullshitting with two guys inside of a jail cell yeah. or two people who are sort of have really seen a lot driving for a while and and pulling each other's chains or telling each other some stories and all that stuff. And then where this show is going and you could tell by like scenes from next week, this is essentially going to be an Oh, I don't watch this. Oh, you don't. I don't. I mean, it just looks like this group of people will band together yeah. to go fight El Cuco. And uh, that's like Given how realistic the show can be at times, Mm -hmm. here's my argument for it, is that this is a prehistoric, unnamed, mythical evil, and it can only be combated by a kind of loose confederation of people who have decided to fight it. And Mm -hmm. when you get down to it, it doesn't really matter if they bring in, like, federal agencies to help them or, Mm -hmm. like, where, where they kick their you know, concerns up to the CDC to talk about, like, who else could be scratched. Right. And all that stuff. CDC is busy right now, Chris. They are. They Are, are they? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that the issue really is, like, what how they tell that story. How they tell this idea that all these people who are in the Georgia, you know, Crime Investigation Bureau or uh, the the Cherokee City Police Department and are mm-hmm. long-serving detectives, that they would essentially be like, Yep, we're just going to go up to Claude and be like, you're being doubled by an ancient spirit. Yep. And he's like, cool, stay in my house. Yeah. You know? Stay in like, my brother's house. Stay in my brother's house. Um, I, I The suspension of disbelief is still there for me, but I can understand why it may be a little bit punctured for some people. Well, I think the two things, when I said I had notes at the beginning, what I meant was this. There were two things that I bumped on in this episode. One, I was very ready for Ben Mendelsohn, Ralph, to make the turn. And be like, I believe. Yes, yeah. because... And I could feel, this is just my perception of it. I know nothing about anything actually going on on the show or behind the scenes. It felt like Mendelssohn was getting frustrated, which is a very strange, subjective thing hmm. to say. His performance of Ralph not believing but being confronted with things that challenged him was devolving, in my opinion, to like a lot of frowns, a lot of frowny faces that felt stifled Yeah, because he is a tremendous and kinetic actor. And I think, well, I'd like to think one of the reasons he chose this part was because of its stillness when, it, you know, generally he's encouraged to go bigger. Yeah. And it's been great to watch. And he's magnetic because you get the feeling that something is coiled up and trying to escape. And it, it, it felt, this the last two weeks were the only times that I felt like he was actually, it was as if he was bound, you know, because he was, he had to be playing the stick in the mud mm-hmm. type of role in the larger gang of however many there are in their gang now. The second thing was, I have some questions about their plan. (laughs) And I would just like to, I would just like to, and listen, I've said this publicly. I've said it in my own writer's room. I think plans are terrible. Uh I think all plans are bad. Do they have a plan? Well, you can never make a good one on television. So it's not, that's not the point. And if he gets you things like that car ride, if it gets you things like Holly saying, I don't like elephants about the puzzle, worth it. Fine. But, As far as I can tell, their plan is to take eight people, all of whom are legally allowed to carry weapons and involve themselves in investigations, apparently across state lines, Mm -hmm. to babysit a bouncer that they know so that they can testify in his defense when someone with his face savagely murders a child in the next 48 hours. They didn't know it was going to be a child. It's always, been, it's always been children. But he also kills the fishermen and, like, a bunch of other people. Well, that's new information for all of us. Okay, yeah. My point is, the thing that they know, so based on Holly's research... This, this, the, the, the play they drew up... Yes. ...takes into account, we'll probably lose another kid in the process. It's basically like, our plan for the Super Bowl is to give up 48 unanswered points, but we are going to defend Andy Reid's clock management in the post-game conference. Right. That's their plan. Because the real victim here... <laughs> Is the losing coach? I, <laughs> I, I'm not saying they had a better plan because the one thing they clearly you clearly watch more football. <laughs> I don't watch football anymore. The one thing they clearly why did Andy Reid win something recently? <laughs> they don't. They don't know. I mean, it's a surprise to everyone. No one is as shocked as they are that 
the actual boogeyman is now hunting in Tennessee nearby. Sure. I think they thought it was going to happen in Cherokee City, which is even more suspect because, they because a large number of them are they in the really employ. only left recent mother Tamika behind to guard the city. Exactly. Yeah. And I feel like on the way out of Dodge, they might have been like, hey, Dodge, Dodge City Schools. Sure. Maybe increase security around uh, pickups and drop offs because the other thing this episode established for us, without a shadow of a doubt, is that parenting styles differ, particularly so you would not in a large gathering your, near caves. You wouldn't let your child wander off with a mask at a cave festival. I have festival. younger children uh-huh. than these people do. I am not Winnebago friendly. Uh-huh. So this is not my lifestyle. However, the words. Let's go sit down and have a cold beer. Have never emerged from my lips since the minute I had my first child. (laughs) That thought has been rattling around in my mind like a pinball for seven years. I've been asking you. But I have (laughs) never once said. I say, do you want to have a cold beer? And you say, no, sir. No, sir. There are caves out there. (laughs) I must remain on watch due to the large prevalence of caves within the continental United States. That's just sensible parenting. Sure. Yeah. So. No wonder you're so tired. I'm exhausted. Now, maybe the day will come when my older child can do two things at once. Eat ice cream with boys and keep her sister from being abducted. Sure. Into a saber tooth cave. <laughs> I'm just saying it's common sense. Yeah. So. No, you, you make some good points. Honestly, sometimes I think you're a little persnickety about this stuff. Sure. Sure. But in this case. I do think it was a weird plan. I think that the idea of going, of bringing all of the people who know what's going on into mm-hmm. one place, yeah. I also think that unambiguously, Claude is safer in prison. Than, Personally, yes, yeah, they like, should have left him if, there. If they, if they could have just talked to those guys into being like, how about we just have a rotating watch of people with Claude this entire time, but he is behind bars for the time but, being. But I also feel like, and maybe this is new information or it was just inessential information, I didn't know that the original, the person that, that, that El Cuco copies, mm-hmm. was particularly in danger other than the fact that he or she will go to jail. I think what they think is if you get six to seven people all with bona fides in law enforcement Mm -hmm. to testify to the fact that they have been with this guy for the last X amount of days, that would be the irrefutable testimony that they need to stop, like, to basically push the El Cuco thing into the light. So they're trying to go public with this. It would appear so. Uh, and because, also weaken El Cuco to the point of being able to f- defeat it. But what's finally. the weaken thing? Because that's the thing. Like, so if they had only just gone to this teacher conference. I got to admit, they Terry, had a long conversation about this at the beginning of the episode, and I, I didn't quite grasp it. Right. Yeah. I'm th- not a single thing we have said, and I mean this sincerely, has affected my enjoyment of the show. Absolutely not. I cannot wait to watch the last two. <laughs> I love watching the show, and I'm going to be sad when it's over. Um. But it was a weird plan. Yeah. Yeah, it was a weird plan. But Grimo, as, this is why you're this is why you're you, man. But you as see someone angles. as someone who's made a show in the eighth episode also features a weird plan <laughs> that gets us to a better place. Yes. Look, hallelujah. It's Do fine. you remember what was the cave in Philly? What was the cavern? Was it Crystal Caverns? Is oh, that a it video was on game? Philly. No, there was a if you took the turnpike out. Yeah. There was a sign, a turnoff. For Did like you ever fuck with st- stalagmites, stalactites? I, I wish there was a Kai, word. Kai, do you know what that is? It which one, which ones go down and which ones go up? I think stalagmites go down. I love that you the confidence <laughs> with Kaya. Talk about no, not you. Talk about cave formations with the confidence of a twenty-something podcast producer. <laughs> Bring that energy into this week. I, I think there's a word maybe in 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 Werner's Sorry, native language. Sorry, I was wrong. Stalagmites go up. Okay. A word in... And what goes down? The other one. Stalactite? Stalactites. Stalagmite. Okay, got it. There Maybe there's a word in, in, in Werner from Better Call Saul's native tongue of German to uh-huh. describe the joy I get when people ask me questions that are so absurd that the only choice... But they're like, you would know this. ...to take them as compliments. Not yeah. about cave formation, but when you're like, Andy, you, do you go to caves? Do you go caving? <laughs> it was like when I was in Albuquerque and someone was like, this is a great place to be on the weekends. You know, there's a uh, indoor rock climbing facility. And I was like, Boy, you're barking up the wrong tree. I have not been in a cave since I saw The Descent. Mm-hmm. 
were you that that it's were like, you a cave habitué prior to that? No, but I do remember going on a field trip, and and I do remember being like as a kind of dinosaur adjacent study field. Because you were thought, interested in dinosaurs. Yeah, as a kid, I thought okay. caves are pretty cool. And also, like, that vague, you know, like, I'm in something prehistoric. I could get lost, but probably not. I mean, you could it, literally get it's lost It's Crystal in Cave. In Crystal Cave. Cuts down PA. Okay. Never made the turn off on the turnpike to it. You did not. No. I did. And I will say that I enjoyed myself. Mm-hmm. But then after I saw The Descent, one of yeah. the scariest movies I've ever seen in my life. Okay. I have never been in a cave since. Um, Nor had I really been in a cave 10 years before The Descent, but that was only just out of negligence, not out of fear. So that was a decisive inflection point, if you will, <laughs> in your caving lifestyle. Kai, ever been in a cave? Several I think she times. feels like she's in one now. Several times? So I've been in several caves. Any, several recently? caves? Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> Why do it, you were keep- they like school field trips? One was a school field trip. Uh, last time I was in Hawaii, I went into a cave and was, I did not have a good time. Was one a mistake? Like, did you just wander into one? Why, wait, why, why did you not like the one in Hawaii? Well, see, the thing is, is that my boyfriend, like, really loves caves. And so a couple times when we've been on vacations, he's sought out caves okay, and fo- dragged me along. Quick, did quick, your boyfriend watch The Outsider? No. Quick follow-up. And I, I don't mean to cast any aspersions about your boyfriend, who seems like a lovely guy. Is he so passionate about caves that he might encourage an underage person to join him <laughs> because he's so excited about the joys of caving that he doesn't, he forgets himself. And yeah. He's like, eight-year-old, come with me because you have to see the way the bears scratch the ceiling of the cave. I'd like to believe he has more sense than that. I'd like to think so, I'd too. I'd like to think so, too. Also, the funny thing about El Cuco, doesn't know a lot about caves. He's like, I don't really know. I mean, I don't know if the saber tooth's been there, but grizzly bears used to be down there. What do you mean he doesn't know a lot? He has a whole line of alternative facts. He knows that bears scratch the ceilings Well, because he is, like, basically a bear. He knows so much more about caves than you or I do, and here you are saying that he doesn't? I don't know. I also think, <laughs> and again— You're on Team El Cuco. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> you're, you're such—you're you're a Bernie bro for El Cuco. No, no, no. <laughs> Listen, I'm about to turn on him. Okay? I am about to Amy Klobuchar. Hashtag El Cuco. not me, us. Hashtag El Cuco. <laughs> I, am, I think that El Cuco's policies are too extreme for the general election. Uh-huh. <laughs> and he needs to pivot to the middle. Yeah. To win back the working class. <laughs> and the children. And the children. The children vote. You know, I think they maybe they foreground this a little bit when they were like, Cecil, Tennessee has a Burger King apparently yeah. in a prison and that's it. Yeah. So maybe there aren't a lot of opportunities. But I do think, and again, I am not trying to see him succeed, but if he did just want to peel off a kid, maybe a large gathering of people. I think he also could have been more subtle. Yeah. Like he didn't have to put his arm around the kid and be like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat you. Yes. You know what I mean? Because I'm wearing a bear mask. Yeah. It could have just been a little bit like, why don't you meet me down over there and I'll show you the cave. Was the assumption... Were we supposed to assume that his face was still a little play doughy, like not fully? Uh, I, I think so, but I think we'll probably see next week because they didn't really get into the iPad photos. I was shout ready out for, to the Cecil PD rocking iPads. Though. I was ready for an, an enhanced montage. I love it when people enhance shit on screens. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Um, right. So that was the reason why he probably continued to wear a bear mask. Oh, I'm sorry, a fox mask. Sure. Also, it was like very El Cuco of him to do so. Well, it was. It was cool. Yeah. Cool AF. Yeah. Um, That's what El Cuco, he really worries about optics. I, <laughs> you know, El Cuco does better in caucuses than primaries. <laughs> Do you have anything else to add? Because he makes a strong case for himself. Um, no, it's just, it, it's, it's been really fun. And obviously we're not done talking about the show over the course of the season. We're just getting started. We got this El Cuco bit to, to really <laughs> take for a walk. But, but. Because it's not just because it's supported this kind of deeper dive in week to week, but it has changed so profoundly week to week. So now what I'm looking forward to, and and by the way, that's the other thing I want to say. The needle drop at the end of the episode was like, cool choice. Mm -hmm. Fucking 180 from everything this show has been. Also, just so cool because Dillard like slowed down. It's like in slow-mo, but the song itself feels like it's almost chipmunked. Yes. Uh, It was really, really neat. But it was very different from everything we've seen before. And so now what I'm psyched on for the for the rest of the season, it seems like we're going to get like a, you know, last stand at the Alamo kind mm-hmm. of episode with our gang, yeah. with some casualties before a final 
fight with an existential prehistoric evil, which is really not where the show I don't, started. I don't think Vegas is no longer taking bets on Claude's brother. Yeah. And I have copper in my mouth. Oh, yeah, but come on. What about, what about Detective GBI? What about... He, I think he'll be fine. He likes to sleep in his car. But first two guys off the off the field are those are those two. Quick question. I'm and asking, probably also Andy. I, oh, come on. <laughs> Andy died Andy's three episodes like, ago. I'm really, really into Holly. <laughs> Can I uh, ask you, as a as a recovering caver, mm-hmm. if you were conscripted into a task force to defeat an ancient evil, yeah, and uh, you knew that the confrontation was coming, would you be like first in line to volunteer to sleep outside. No, and I bet I felt like that was very unrealistic. I thought that they would just be covered in dew. Oh, that was your note? Yeah, like it's not comfortable covered to sleep in... outdoors on a couch in in, in Tennessee. Well, is it? that couch alone, I mean with the humidity and the moisture has some issues. Yes. Yeah. But for me it was less about the natural condensation of uh morning as it was, there is a the aforementioned ancient evil stalking motherfuckers. Also, I just feel like, like they could, time they're to not get throwing natural. their weight around enough. Like, just go to the Marriott and be like, we're going to need to commandeer some space here. Yeah, like we could take Claude and put him in a different we, place. We know it's cave stock, but we've got an ancient evil prowling the, the territory. We can wrap it up there. We'll be back on Thursday. We've got Eva Anderson, one of the writers of Briar Patch, joining us on Thursday to talk about episode three. We'll also talk sure about a bunch of other stuff. We'll, we can chat about episode two of Saul if you want. I'd love to. So we'll be back on Thursday. Stay tuned for my interview with Greg Dooley. Check out his new album, Random Desire, which is available now. And, and turn your TVs on after wrestling on USA Network. Please do. <laughs> get you and your crash test dummy. Get El Cuco. Get the masks out. Whatever Actually, you got to do. I misspoke. Turn your TVs on for all of wrestling. Support, support wrestling, man. It's supporting me. It's a pleasure to welcome back one of my favorite musicians ever, Greg Dooley. What's up, man? Thanks Hi, for coming Chris. back to The Watch. Nice to be back. Greg has a solo record coming out called Random Desire, so I was I, I jumped at the chance to talk to him again, and I, I can't wait to talk about this record specifically, which I love. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the sort of the genesis of it and the circumstances around it. I know you started working on it at, as like the wig cycled down right after, after um, In Spades, and then I know obviously the, the tragic passing of, of your friend, um, of, uh, of Dave Rosser. Was this a kind of therapy for you or was it like a decompression coming off of a wig cycle or was this something that you had always kind of thought was going to happen after after that last wigs record? Um, I didn't know. Here's what happened after the last wigs record. Uh, Jack White called Patrick to see <laughs> if uh, uh, if he was up for doing another Rack and Tours yeah. record after 10 years and he was and I knew that was going to be make a record tour so that was a big chunk of time. Uh, John Curley went back to college. Hmm. Does he still live out, out in Ohio? He lives still yeah. lives in Cincinnati. Goes to the University of Cincinnati. Oh, now. cool. John Skibbick, uh, he and his wife were uh, got pregnant. Oh, that's and were great. having a baby. So people were very preoccupied with other things. Right. And that's when I decided to that I would after we did the Built to Spill tour which was the back end of the album cycle. That was 2018. That's when I, I was working on songs, but I didn't know what they were for yet. And then when everybody shared their plans with me, I decided that I was going to start making a record but of my own. But the the um, I really did it in about six months. Okay. So probably like last February, I got a hot hand. <laughs> and uh, uh, when you get a hot hand, you just start, you just start playing it. So uh, um, I pretty much did the record between February and July of, of 19. last year. Yeah. I was still tweaking it in the fall, but it was, for all intents and purposes, done last summer. I'm going to skip ahead and ask a question I meant to ask you a little bit later in, in the interview, but I was wondering whether or not you were at a point where you're like, you Nick Cave it and you get up every day and write, or whether it is kind of like a hot, a hot hand situation and you're just like, oh, I'm feeling it now, so it's going to happen now. I'm probably somewhere between uh, Jason Pierce and Nick Cave, which uh, uh, I think I think Nick Cave got on Jason Pierce about his waiting to be inspired yeah. sort of thing. I have been guilty of that in the past. I don't know if anyone works as hard as Nick Cave as far as writing songs anyway. I certainly don't. But uh, um, 
I am always writing something, working on something. In regards to this record, I got when you get a hot hand, you 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 stay on it, mm-hmm. and then you do probably conjure your inner Nick Cave. And yeah. Once I had a, like five songs, I started kind of actively going at it, you know, like mm-hmm. trying to work up new stuff to the point where I thought I had a record done. And I had the 10 songs. One of them wasn't working. Mm-hmm. So I took it out and wrote a song specifically for that slot. Yeah. So, and and did you, in your mind, were, the, one of the things that's sort of delightful about this record is its compactness. It's like, it's neat. It's like in and out in 37 minutes. Was that around where you wanted this to wind up or was that around where you were like, this is the material I have? I've gotten fond of brevity yeah. in records. And like we were talking about movies when we were walking across yeah. the lot here. Self-editing is something that everyone should and could do, you know. And I imagine you have less people telling you what to do at this point in your life, yeah, too. Yeah, you know, but I, the person I worked with most closely with this record was Christopher Thorne. Mm-hmm. He has a studio in uh, Joshua Tree. Christopher has been recording for as, as long as I have. He's guitar player in Blind Melon mm-hmm. and um, has done a lot of great work. He's such a great one-on-one guy because he, he will go 12 hours. He will go... To three in the morning, yeah, uh, and not many people will anymore. Uh, so that's great for me because once I get going, I like to do 10, 12 hours. Yeah, and, uh, a lot of people want to stick with the eight hour day, and I, I, I need more than that. You want double shift? I just need. I once I get rolling, I like to keep going, and you know, I mean, there becomes a point where it's you know diminishing returns, but. You can get a lot done in the middle of the night. Yeah. And uh, uh, especially are when— you, Are you like a start at 8 p.m. kind of person? No, I'm going to start at 2 p.m. Okay. But I like to go till like 2, 3 in the morning. I yeah. like to do 12 or 13 hours. That's and what's morning. the recovery? Like is there a LeBron James cryo chamber to like kind of get ready for the next no, day or is it just kind of flow? I'm ready at 2 o'clock again the next day. I, <laughs> That's great. I, you know, I mean, I don't really need a ton of sleep. I sleep like five or six hours yeah. you know, a day. But we had, a, we had a really good rhythm going, Chris and I. And I've been working with him for about – he worked on the Last Wigs record as well. But this was the most intensive that we had ever worked, and it, you know, worked out pretty good. And I know Chris obviously plays on the record, I believe. He does not. He does not. He no. just, just worked on the engineering. Mm-hmm. But John Theodore plays on it, and there's you, – you had help. But I was curious about with you handling – would you say it's fair to say a majority of the instrumentation? Probably 90% of it, yeah. Okay, so um, – how does that change the the songs you're writing? I mean, how does it change, like, you obviously probably don't feel limited by your own expertise, but is there almost like a coloring within the lines thing happening when you're like, I'm going to play this, so whatever it's going to be, there's no Steely Dan back in band well, coming current, in? Well, far, far from that. <laughs> so um, I'm a very remedial drummer, bass player, so for the songs that I am the drummer on, which is the majority of the songs, uh, it had to be within my skill set, yeah. so to speak. But happily, most of these songs fell in that regard. One of them in particular was within my skill set, but I let John Theodore take a stab at it, and he destroyed my take. So <laughs> I was like, all right, it's, you can, you know, it's enough out of you. But he played uh, he played two songs, one song in which I was so far beyond what I could play. Yeah. Like I, I just I had to have it. Which one was that? That was Sempre. Okay. The second song. He I just there's no way I could do that. The rest of them were things that I could do. And and that was uh that's that's always a thrill for me because drums were my first instrument. Yeah. And uh um and I, I enjoy playing them. Do you ever so. practice them or is it just like no. when you're around you just play a little bit? No. But yeah. yeah, I don't have a, I don't have a set. You yeah, know, I would need to go to someone's house. Kind of like when I was a kid, I didn't have a, a set. When I was a kid, I would go to this guy David Bunn's house. Yeah, and uh, his mom and dad worked all day, so you could go over there and just go crazy. And it, by by the time I was playing his drums, he had moved on to guitar. So I was I was exactly what he wanted someone to play drums along with him. I remember when I used to be have either in bands or have a really close proximity to bands in Boston in the '90s. There was always that funny thing where like. Two guitar players could have all these influences in common, but at the end of the day, they just needed a drummer. Yes. So it would always be like that was where like the metalhead Hesher guy was like 
sure, I'll play in your My Bloody Valentine right, band. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know? the, and, and anything to play drums to. Yeah. You know, so that was good for me. I was wondering about, um, I want to talk specifically about some of the songs on the record, but one of the things that I get so excited about with you is uh, how you share like the music you're listening to and what a big evangelist you are for the, for the stuff you're listening to. I was wondering what kind of stuff you were listening to during the making of or writing of this record that might have might be surprising or might have had a little bit of an influence on on the album. Um, I listened to for whatever reason I, I was I was listening to air. Oh. Yeah. Quite a bit on my way back and forth. I was also listening to uh, a lot of jazz, Donald Byrd in particular, uh Herbie Hancock also. As far as as far as music that was influencing me, I would I wouldn't say influencing uh directly but uh uh there's this group from minneapolis called night moves mm -hmm. who, who, I, yeah, re of course. who yeah. I really like and their their last record was done by um jimino the drummer for spoon okay and uh just such an amazing production job i i i definitely took some inspiration from not only that the the group but the way he mixed the record was was uh was interesting to me as yeah well. I, I i always feel funny asking those questions just because i i sometimes get great you know expect people to say like yeah you know like we were definitely just thinking of you know like this prince record or i was thinking of this prince record when i was making the records i wanted it to feel that way but i know that it's sometimes it's a lot more um the the connections could be a lot more obscure and speaking of prince though there was a moment in um the song scorpio where I I kind of got stuck for something to do for the the bridge, and uh, I tried something I didn't like it. But while I was driving along, listening to it in my car, I kept singing the uh, a piece of if if I was your girlfriend. Yeah, and uh, I liked it so much that I got a pitch shifter and I I did a tribute to. Uh, the Camille character on uh, <laughs> uh, on on Sign of the Times, so uh, um, there is the Prince inspiration. Well, I, yeah, I mean, there, it always seems like he's he's not far from from your music. Um, I was wanted to ask you a little bit about um, the difference between if you saw a specific difference because you know this is your first solo album, but I, I was wondering whether you considered Amber Headlights to be more your first solo album, or was that just more of a, a project that was kind of happening in between Twilight Singers records? Um, Amber Headlights is, is songs that I did not use for Blackberry Bell. Right. So uh, it's just a, a lot of outtakes. Right. And uh, um, it was never done as a, a solo record. The reason why it has my name on it First of all, it's Greg Dooley's. Dooley's. That's why I was wondering. Yeah, and uh, uh, it, you know, it's just it was something in my computer that people kept asking me about, and I'm like, oh, I'll put it out. Yeah, you know, and I don't disavow it. I don't disown it. I love I love the songs on there, and we'll probably play more than one of them during this tour. But it was not started as a solo record, and and it was when it came out, it was. The songs were already four years old yeah. when they came out, so it's it's not you know I don't consider it uh, like a statement record. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean it was just it was something that people asked about, and I had it, and and I gave it to them. Do you feel yeah. like you have other things like that, like lying around on hard I drives? I have a and... ton. I have a I have a ton of stuff. I have. There's probably a Twilight Singers double record. No shit, really. That that, that never came out. You know, I mean not. Just uh, through the years, I compiled enough songs to right. make it to make a double record that do I you, didn't put out. Do you take joy in and and do you enjoy the like being your own archivist and being your own sort of like executor of your of your musical estate in in the process like that, or are you kind of like always moving forward? No, I do because I have gone back and plundered the vaults for certain things. On Due to the Beast Alone, Parked Outside was a uh, was sitting in the vault. Algiers was sitting in the vault. Lost in the Woods oh, was wow. sitting in the vault. So I, I conjured those up. And from for this record, uh, a ghost was in the vault. And uh and Scorpio was in the vault. No way. 
Yeah. Um, not they, they weren't as old as the songs that I mentioned, but uh, uh, A Ghost was from 2016, just the riff. Mm-hmm. I didn't have a, a vocal. And uh, um, Scorpio was from 2017. But the rest of the songs came in that, that fe- six month February, period. February to July, whatever that was. Um, you know, I, I, th- I we've talked before about you know, the non-musical influences on your work over the years. And I know that you, um, I know that you, you know, you, like famously in, in, in some Afghan Wigs records are like written and directed by, by Greg Dooley. Right. I was curious whether or not there was stuff you were watching during like the, the last year or so that, that played into Random Desire at all. I really like, I, I find the, the album cover so evocative mm-hmm. and uh, tone setting, you know, that sure. I was curious, like, it, for some reason, like the first thing I think of when I look at it was Paris, Texas, but it it's like I bet there's uh I bet there's a lot of stuff going on there. I, I yeah, I, I would have to think about what I was watching. But the show that I watched in the last year that moved me more than any other show was Mr. In Between. Did you see that? Oh no. Oh really? It's it, it's up there with – I put it up there with Breaking Bad, The Wire. Huh. I put it up there. I, I fully put it up there. That was on FX, right? Yeah. It's on FX. It's an Australian show. It's a half-hour show, which is – it doesn't feel like that. Mm-hmm. It really feels like you're in it for a lot longer than you are. A little bit of a uh, – Somebody asked me what I could compare it to, and I'm like, well, you can't compare it to it because it's two different places. But it had a little bit of a justified mm-hmm. feel to it. But the guy who wrote and, and stars in it, like, he's just he just owns the character. Huh. And uh, um, Joel Edgerton's brother. Oh, Nash, uh, Nash Edgerton. Yeah, di- right. Di- directed all of them. Okay. So, uh, um, and his and, – and, Plays an interesting part in one of the episodes. He 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 guests in and he gets he gets dealt with rather violently. <laughs> uh, it's pretty uh, pretty fabulous. But um, yeah, love that show. Yeah, that, it's not that, often that like I haven't seen something like I'm that. I'm surprised. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. And, But um, but but then again, I'm not because a lot of people. I'll I'll bring this up to people and they're like, oh, I don't even know what that is. And I'm like, you need to watch it immediately. All right, I'm gonna go. Ch- I'm gonna check it out tonight. Yeah, uh, there's only it. there's only two seasons. The first season's abbreviated, okay. So it's like eight, maybe seven or eight, and then you get the full the full Monty. The second season, I don't I don't know if they've if they've re upped it, but they I hope they do. Yeah, uh, but they left it they left it in a good spot if they didn't. Okay. So. How are you feeling um, as an Angelino these days? As a you know, I was I was I always think of you when I think about this city because I know. Um, I know you've lived here for such a long time, and this place has changed so much, even since I've lived here. But I'm sure since you've lived here, I always kind of wonder. I know that you've recorded this. You know, this record was recorded in New Orleans. A lot of it was recorded in Joshua Tree. But to what extent, like any current day Los Angeles seeps into your stuff? Well, I did. I did a, a song um, at Gold Diggers down the street. Yeah, uh, my friend Dave's. That's my friend Dave's place. I did. I tracked one there, and I did some overdubs there. So I was there twice. But yeah, this was probably the least Los Angeles. Uh, although I, you know, I mean, I I wrote a lot of it in my house, but uh, I still love it here. Yeah. So it, yeah. it's it's uh, um, after the last Wigs tour, I I I basically stayed here. Really? Yeah. But I I finally got on an airplane last fall and went to. Uh, I took a proper European vacation. Oh, I'd nice. Ne- I'd never been on one before. I'd, I'd been to <laughs> Europe, like, no joke, 60 times. Yeah. But I never went there just to do a holiday, so I did do that. That's never occurred to me that that yeah. must be the case. I bet it's like, it's like for you and for pro athletes, it's like you've seen everything, but you've never actually been anywhere. But, I, yeah, so I, I, went, I went to England for a week, and I went to uh, Italy for 10 days. Yeah. And I uh, went to – I lived in Italy for a year back in 2005. Oh, wow. We're in Italy. And I lived in Milan. Uh-huh. We worked for a month in Sicily, and then I toured all over the country. But I never went to Amalfi Coast, and that's where I went. Oh, in, that's not uh, bad. In, uh, in September. What did you think uh, of Eng- England as a tourist? Or- I loved England as a tourist. I, again, in September, I had never been to England in the fall. Beautiful weather. It was warm. 
It rained for 20 minutes one afternoon, yeah. which was actually kind of nice because I was inside sleeping anyway. I always have these romantic notions. I have some family over there, and my wife and I went for Thanksgiving, not this past one, but the one before. And like as we were arriving, I was just like, this is just, I feel like I'm very at home here. I can't wait. And then after like three days of it getting dark at 2.30 p.m. and like ice raining all day long, I was like, oh, yeah, I think Los Angeles might have yeah. might have broken me in a little bit. The, go in the fall. Yeah. I've never toured Europe in the fall, and I'm going to try to do that this year. I, I've, I've asked if they would set me up some shows there because the weather is fantastic. Yeah. Everybody in September, most people are back from their holidays. So you get you get a rested, happy populace, you know? Yeah. And it was uh um I, I that that's when I would go whenever if I if I if I were to Because you're usually back. there for like summer festival season? I do summers and I usually I've I've toured a lot in the winter hmm. in Europe, which is <laughs> bad beat dark and cold yeah and, but yeah fall in europe that's my that's my speaking that's, of playing live like you're you're gonna take this record out i was wondering whether or not it being a solo record and you playing so much of this stuff would you are you envisioning more of like an evening with greg dooley kind of thing or are you gonna put together a band and like have it be i have a band okay uh i in in the past when i've toured as my name i just i it's acoustic guitars yeah. and you know, a piano, maybe a couple other guys. But uh, um, these songs need to be realized mm -hmm. in there. And it's interesting because I've made the, I made them all in the studio. I've never played any of them live. So really? I, I um, back in January, I went down and played with the rhythm section in New Orleans just to see what it felt like. And it, it's actually, it's actually pretty cool. But uh, I will take this time to, uh, reconnect with the Twilight Singers material, which has been kind of on hiatus yeah. for a while. So it'll be it'll be fun to play those songs again. Um I got a cool show. I've 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 already kind of made a couple set lists and uh um it moves around nicely. It That's co cool. Co covers everything. Um I was wondering whether or not like that there's like a little bit of training that goes into because like I feel like on this record there's vocal performances that I haven't really heard from you before. You know, um, is that like a different mindset to get into when you know you're going to be playing these songs live? Like there's there's some beautiful singing on this. Not that you don't do that on other records, but I think that there's like almost like a a lot, a lot of melodic stuff happening with your vocals on this record that that didn't seem like necessarily like, you know, Afghan Ways is a rock band. You know? It's a rock band. And yeah. this is this is not I mean, there's a couple rock songs yeah. on this record, but maybe two. The rest of them are kind of uh, cabaret-ish. Yeah. So I I worked pretty hard on the singing, and I have to say, like, Christopher Thorne is he, – he is not afraid to say, you can do better. Yeah. You can do better. You can do better. And what I would mostly do is do uh, – I'd do six takes, and then we'd do a comp of, okay. of, 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 of the best one. But occasionally, like if I got if if I was if I was doing really well, like for instance on Pantomima, the first song, yeah, the main vocal is three vocals. Okay, the chorus is seven vocals. Wow. So uh, we ended up using all of that stuff because I I, I was being really consistent with my performances. So uh, um, that was doubling and tripling voices was something I had not done a ton of, and we did quite a bit of that on this record that's so cool yeah i was curious about whether or not uh i wanted to ask you a little bit about one of my favorite tracks um is lockless okay yeah and i just i think the the sort of like the the horn dirge in it is beautiful did you record that one in in new orleans or okay here here is here's the story of lockless um was working um and this this happens many times and it's always it's it's always it's never not magical trying to find a sound on an instrument for a different song okay where, where there's and you're just you're just stabbing along you're just basically getting sounds for the engineer i was doing a mellotron for i can't even remember which song and there was a horn sample already plugged in Fuck. okay to the mellotron so that was the first thing i hit 
was the horn sample. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. And then I started moving my hand around and he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I think I'm doing a new song. You should start a new, <laughs> you should start a new take. So I I did the um I did the chord progression. I wrote it really fast. And then we needed drums, but there were no drums set up. So I beatboxed oh, the man. drums. And uh, and then we replaced like the you know the lower part with an 808. And then there's hi-hat. But other than that, my voice is the drum beat. And then for uh for I was going down to New Orleans later in this. I went down to New Orleans last June, and that's halfway through the song. Real horns come in and overtake the horn yeah. sample, and that's and I recorded those horns in New Orleans. Oh, that's wonderful! Yeah. That's such a great happy accident. It was a the the whole song was a happy accident. Never had done a song like that before. Never really sang like that before. I started. Uh, uh, there's a, a different voice that I use on mm-hmm. on this record on three or four songs that uh, Christopher called Mr. Molasses. <laughs> he was like, "You should do Mr. Molasses there," and I'm like, "Okay." You know? Oh, well, you got to release like a Moody Band type style, like Mr. Molasses, right, there you go. like, like, like yeah. Deep House with you singing over. I, it. I, or re- maybe he he suggested that I read. Uh, bedtime stories yeah. as Mr. Molasses. That's right. We give, so. give you your own podcast. Yeah, yeah. Um, last question is, you know, one of the great things about following you over these these past few decades is the way in which these projects that you're involved with have their own identity, their their own almost like mythology around them. And I was wondering whether or not, not necessarily like predict out the future, but like is something like Twilight Singers or Gutter Twins like kind of in a box now or do you feel like there are things that you write that you're like that feels like a gutter twin song or that feels like something i want to do in like a future twilight singers thing or is it all just kind of like we'll see where we're at when i'm done writing these songs we'll see where we're at i think uh for instance there were a couple songs i tried to get lanigan to come sing Mm -hmm. with me on this record and he was in europe once and he or or maybe even twice Mm -hmm. because he's gone all the time but uh so I I did his voice for him. Oh, <laughs> uh, and uh, um, so in in a couple of ways, I I sort of had that idea and just co opted his his voice into into my own. I have some songs that I've written for Mark, mm-hmm. and that I'm holding. And then there's uh, Twilight Singers. I don't know because that was such a very specific thing, and it was it was. It started out as a side project, and then the wigs broke up for the first time, like Mm -hmm. right, right, very near that. So I, I sort of folded my band dreams into that one. Uh, Now I have the wigs as my band again, so uh, I think that's why I didn't do this as a Twilight Singers record. I did it as my own because it's sort of my own. Is there like a a notes app? page that you have of like of like imaginary bands that you're like one day or or like just like where you're just like this is a good song for like this john carpenter have, 80s yeah, synth band wow. i'm gonna start you yeah, know i mean like, i you know what i actually had a um i i ran into thurston moore a few years ago and uh and you guys played in backbeat together we played in backbeat together but we were talking about doing uh like a tangerine dream yeah. type band that we were going to call I think tangerine cream or something. <laughs> I can't remember. I was I was really high when I when I when I talked to him, but uh, yeah, uh, that 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 was the that was the last time I discussed a, a new right. project. Here you here first, tangerine cream. Tangerine cream coming soon, and hopefully uh, hopefully I'll see him out there. And yeah. we'll, soundtrack we'll, of Dune. You know, exactly. sure. <laughs> Greg, thanks so much for coming by the watch again. Thank man. you, Chris.